Pakistan is heading to elections on February 8th amid unprecedented chaos. The most significant player over the past few years, former Prime Minister Imran Khan and his party, the PTI, is facing a massive crackdown. Now, Imran is in jail after having been convicted of multiple crimes and his party has been denied its traditional symbol. Meanwhile, an old warhorse, former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif is back and his Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz party seems to have the edge. The elections are taking place at a time of great hardship for most working class Pakistanis. What are the key issues in this election? We go to Abdul to find out. Abdul, thanks so much for joining us. A very contentious election taking place in Pakistan. Uh, you know, uh, very difficult circumstances. Also politically quite unique. We have three major parties now as opposed to a traditional two. So maybe could you give us an outline of who are the major contenders? What is the kind of context in which this election is taking place? Well, in Pakistan, there are uh, three major parties, as you rightly pointed out, in this election. Of course, one of these parties is Pakistan Tehri Ke which is led by Imran Khan, who is in jail. Though all the surveys indicate that he is the most popular leader in the country at this moment, of course, he is in jail and he can't contest the elections. Even his party has been denied the electoral symbol. And that means that all his candidates uh, who are contesting are contesting as independents. So PTI as a party is not there uh, in the election. Uh, most of his, all of his candidates are contesting independently. Um, other two major parties, of course, are PMLN, uh, Pakistan Muslim League, Nawaz, because uh, former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif was allowed to come back to the country, cases against him were withdrawn, and even the uh, ban uh, on, uh, on him contesting elections for a lifetime was lifted. Uh, that would mean that given the, uh, you can say, the favorable conditions in which PMLN is operating, uh, it may be uh, the, uh, you can say, the leading uh, contender for the uh, making government after the results are announced on February 8th. Other major party, of course, is the traditional uh, center-left party called PPP, Pakistan People's Party, led by uh, Bilawal Bhutto, uh, the son of former Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto, and also the uh, uh, former President Jardari. And he, of course, in this election, has does not have, it seems, whatever the surveys are saying, does not have major uh, um, impact. Uh, though he remains very strong in some of the provinces, for example, Sindh, uh, which is a major stronghold of the party. Apart from these major contenders, um, there are also smaller parties like Fazlul Haq's party, uh, Jamaat-e uh, uh, Islami and uh, Jamaat-e Ulma uh, Pakistan and others. Uh, apart from that, there are also smaller parties like left-wing groups fighting elections. Uh, but of course, they do not have much influence across the nation. They are uh, focused on certain constituencies or certain provinces. For example, Fazlul Haq's party is the major contender of Imran Khan's uh, PTI in one of the provinces called Khay uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. So uh, uh, since uh, PTI is not contesting as a party, he, his party may have greater chances of winning uh, seats. But of all of it depends on how uh, the voter turnout is and how free and fair the counting is because there are speculations about uh, if despite the fact that uh, PTI has not been allowed to contest, there may be some last minute attempts by the establishment as it is known in Pakistani politics uh, to kind of uh, change the results in favor if in case it is going against uh, their uh, calculations. Right, Abdul, uh, could you also maybe take us through what are the sort of socio-political challenges that Pakistan is facing right now that will high, be high on the agenda of any government that comes to power? What is the sort of, you know, what is the ground situation for the majority of people of this country? Well, uh, majority of Pakistanis at this moment are primarily concerned about their economic concerns economic uh, problems which they are facing for many years now. Uh, uh, even uh, during COVID and post-COVID, the situation has become much and much uh, gradually worse, despite the fact that Pakistan was kind of uncertain. In fact, because of the fact, we should say, because it was able to uh, get $3 billion loan from IMF, 
it had to fulfill certain conditionalities which had led to further deterioration of the basic uh, economic conditions of the people and and that basically reflected in the rise of prices of the essential commodities uh, uh, essential services like electricity uh, food and so on and so forth uh, one should remember that uh, this pakistan apart from having uh, suffered the covid outbreak there was also uh, 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 basically a massive flood which kind of completely devastated the rural areas in pakistan and basically delayed the recovery from uh, covid you can say and uh, structurally pakistan economy is not uh, good for many many decades now and that basically is you can say is the primary uh, uh, concern apart from that in, in this election one major issue is raised by uh, since pakistan has uh, 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 Pakistani politics has been a, a kind of a, you can say seesaw between the army and the political groups, the civilian groups, um, parties, and uh, a compromise between them have been the mode of operation, you can say, mode of functioning of the Pakistani state for a very long time because of the Imran Khan's you can say so-called uh, rebellion or whatever you call it, uh, and PTI's strong stand against. Uh, uh, military's role in Pakistan politics that has also become a major issue uh, uh, in this election. Uh, apart from the economic issues which the Pakistanis are facing, apart from that, Pakistan, of course, has a major issue of security uh, in terms of uh, the rise of, uh, or you can say, re-rise of uh, Pakistan's Taliban uh, in Pakistan. Uh, apart from that, there are also, uh, you can say, elements in certain provinces like Baluchistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, which have been, of course, uh, there have there have been there have been tussle between the uh, political elements in these two provinces with the central uh, government in Islamabad, but also because of the religious uh, uh, rise of religious fundamentalism, which of course has a larger impact because of geopolitics in the region. That also becomes a major issue in Pakistan's politics. So uh, uh, if one has to identify, of course, there are other issues which have been raised. For example, corruption, uh, which has been made. Uh, there is an attempt to made it, make it an issue Pakistan, uh, in Pakistan primarily because each of the parties, Ali's uh, uh, other party of indulging in corruption and aligning with the military uh, to gain power. So that becomes, uh, these are, you can say, a set of major issues. Uh, one major issue, which is, you can say, unique, uh, relatively unique to this election is the role of external interference in Pakistan politics, because again, related to Imran Khan's stances since his uh, removal from power in April in the no confidence vote in parliament, he has raised a, a pitch that this is primarily because of the external intervention, interventions made by the US. And that has basically helped mobilize a large number of support uh, across Pakistan in favor of his party. So, yeah, these are the set of issues which Pakistanis are facing in this election. Uh, yeah. Abdul, thanks so much. We'll come back to you when the results are out and we can see what the new government will mean for the people of Pakistan. This year's National Day celebrations in New Zealand have seen major protests as indigenous groups are resisting what they see as a government's bid to dilute the Treaty of Waitangi an 1840 agreement between colonists and Maori chiefs. The issue has been building up for a while due to the government proposal to bring a bill that will reinterpret this treaty. This has been strongly opposed by indigenous groups. We go to Anish for the latest on this. Anish, thanks so much for joining us. The governments often try to pitch national days as, you know, moments of unity to bring everyone together. But this time, for understandably good reasons, there has been a lot of debate and controversy in New Zealand. So take us to what these debates are about. We have actually uh, spoken about this before as well, but uh, to our audience who haven't, who are yet to know, uh, it's it, uh, the matter is about uh, the Maori identity and the fact that uh, they are the indigenous people of New Zealand uh, that is brought uh, that has been brought to question right now under the government of Christopher Luxon, and this is uh, something that was uh, kind of expected because Luxon and also his uh, alliance partners in the government right now, which is a three-party coalition of you know center right and right and more right uh, and it pretty much uh, seeks to take out uh, aspects of this foundational treaty uh, which is the treaty of waitangi 
uh, that would act, uh, that would that gives and entitles the indigenous uh, Maoris uh, to being the original uh, inhabitants of uh, New Zealand, and obviously the kind of entitlements and rights that come with it, and even claims of sovereignty, which is still based on uh, the treaty, but uh, is yet to be realized in many ways uh, within the New Zealand uh, political setup. Nevertheless, uh, the fact that they are trying to codify it and with codification comes uh, the manner in which it is to be interpreted, which is uh, something that still is a nebulous territory when it comes to legal and constitutional uh, framework of the New Zealand government. So interpreting that uh, coming from a right-right and far-right government uh, is going to be far more tricky because they are probably, uh, like obviously they are ones who have been using the term of you know, or the mask of uh, calling for equality and equality among all people and citizens as, uh, you know, a mask or a facade to basically wipe out any kind of consideration of indigenous rights or indigenous sovereignty and their land rights, obviously. And this is something that the Maoris have taken quite seriously. Uh, for months now, we have talked about, uh, we have seen actually uh, Maori leaders uh, across the board actually take up, uh, you know, protest and any, uh, all sorts of protests uh, they could think of uh, to actually prevent any kind of rollback of whatever, uh, you know, progress has been made when it comes to indigenous rights, which is, again, primarily based on the Treaty of Aitangi's uh, uh, document and not just the document, the kind of provisions that are there in it. Uh, for those who do not know, uh, the Aitangi Treaty was pretty much uh, the foundational treaty for the, what we today understand as New Zealand. And it, well, it was basically signed between British colonists and uh, about uh, hundreds of uh, Maori chiefs at the time. And it pretty much established a, a relationship uh, of basically uh, that would be interpreted in many ways as a relationship between two nations. And that is something that has been carried out in, uh, in many manners. Obviously, the treaty was not perfect. There were uh, quite a lot of ambiguity. There were quite a lot of ambiguity in terms of the translations that were uh, made. So obviously, there are issues there. And uh, at you know, various times, different uh, racist and right-wing governments have taken uh, positions that have actually uh, affected uh, indigenous uh, rights. But nevertheless, the treaty has always been this, uh, you know, this document that Maoris have used to uh, assert their sovereignty and has always been seen as a blueprint of what any kind of uh, recognition of indigenous rights should look like, in, especially in countries like Australia, uh, or for that matter, many North American countries where, you know, the colonial governments continue in many ways. While, the, while indigenous rights and indigenous lands continue to be encroached upon. All right, Anish, thank you so much for that update. And that's all we have in Daily Debrief. We'll be back tomorrow with a fresh episode. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button.